Hello. Hi. Oh my god. Doing this again. I read 56 books this year. Boy, did this year sneak up on me. Holy fucking shit. My reading goal this year was 52 books. That was one book a week. I finished my initial goal on October 31st. Spooky time to finish any goal. I read quite a bit less than last year, which is fine. I took my own advice, but I certainly read enough to keep me busy. So uh, anyway, um, how was your year? What can I say about 2020 that hasn't been said already in a myriad of ways. My video last year depicting all the struggles that were going on around the world outside of the United States actually did make some of my friends feel a bit better because here in the US, in the belly of the beast, we don't hear about the resistance outside of the US. But this year it's a little different because the international struggle developed in my own country which was fun. Honestly, there's too much to even mention. So good job, and I'm also sorry. But I will note that the largest strike in human history with 250 million people is going on right now in India. Solidarity with them, and I hope that we learn the lessons that they're feeding us. This is exactly what we need to be doing here in the American context. Both bourgeois parties are rapidly losing legitimacy due to their inaction in the face of a pandemic, inequality, racial injustice, climate disaster. This is the backdrop for my reading habits. The need for strong working class, independent parties and organizations has never been felt to be more important and critical than it is now. We need to continue to develop that in the oncoming year, which is just a change of number. Everything's the same. Everything's the same. So, what did I read? Well, first off, I reread some things. I reread my beloved works from H.G. Wells, and I also reread Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I think my favorite reread of this year was War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds is the first book that I ever really read social critique into. I was reading this and I was like, this has gotta be about something, right? I'm all like backstage for Fiddler on the Roof, 17 or whatever. And I'm like, oh man, aliens doing imperialism to us, but, <gasps> We do imperialism to other people, now it's bad. It was great rereading it, and it's the blueprint for a bunch of really fun movies. On to fiction. You may notice that I've read a lot more fiction this year. The reason for that is that I became an English major. I decided to add another major. I'm now a philosophy English major and a film minor. And a very employable day to you, sir. So in terms of plays, in terms of theater, I only read one piece of theater, and it's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. This may have been an attempt for me to redeem myself and try to appreciate Shakespeare because last video I revealed to you that I don't really like reading Shakespeare because I'm impatient and obtuse. But let me tell you that it was fine. On to young adult and normal fiction we'll call it. <laughs> A friend of mine recommended Kafka on the Shore, which was lovely. I read Lost Children Archive, which was devastating. Some of my favorite picks of the year in terms of normal fiction. I really loved reading William Faulkner. I couldn't pick between Absalom, Absalom, which I think was a better book, and The Sound and the Fury. I think the consistency of Absalom, Absalom I appreciated more, but Sound and the Fury will be more memorable. I think my two favorite fiction books of the year though were Mossad Hamid's Exit West. It really spoke to me on so many different levels. It weaves the poetic with the prose. Very enjoyable to read these large ornate schemas of thought that move from mundane to the profound very quickly, all of which tells of a very interdependent humanity, making for a very humane story. And of course, how could I not absolutely adore 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, my dude! From the first page, it's just so beautiful, and it's like historical. Long live the Liberal Party! Very imaginative, which makes sense, because magic realism and all that stuff. Oh, I love his writing so much. My favorite book last year 
was Love in the Time of Cholera, and he's just so great. Latin American authors deserve your fucking attention. Now, before I'm done, I read a lot more black literature this year. No reason. I don't know. Just felt like it. Eh. Some of my picks for my favorite black literature were Sula by Toni Morrison, How Could I Not Absolutely Adore I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, which was just a wonderful fucking coming of age story. But, like, easily. My favorite was Beloved by Toni Morrison, because how can you beat it? I actually used my friend's copy of Beloved. Thank you so much, friend. You're a very good friend. Just the depth and complexity of the themes and the characterization, the atmosphere, the everything. It's just so devastating and beautifully written. And all the way to the last sentence of the protagonist asking me, me? Oh, heartbreaking. Beautiful stuff. That's the kind of fucking writing that gets you the Nobel Prize in literature, turns out. Okay, on to nonfiction. I did read a little bit of history, and on this I read a couple picks that were recommended by a beautiful Danish man, including The Many-Headed Hydra, talking about the slave trade. I think my favorites were What's My Name, Fool, which was a discussion of resistance and organization within the sports community. I don't know anything about sports. So this was a wonderful way for me to familiarize myself with the world of sports through a lens that I enjoy, which is shitting on sports. Wonderful history on fighting against racism, against sexism, against general inequality. Didn't know that some of the strongest unions came out of the sports world. And this year, as I was reading it, was when the basketball players went on strike and won. And my other favorite was the very in vogue Caliban and the Witch by autonomous Marxist Silvia Federici. And it was largely written as a polemic against orthodox Marxist thought. I'm yet to read a criticism of the historical methodology. I know that there are critiques, but I thought honestly she could have made her argument without really focusing on the witch trials that much, though they are fascinating but it was a way to look at the differentiation of gender roles according to the needs of production inherent to the beginnings of capitalism. I also read quite a bit of philosophy this year, quite a bit on free will because I was taking a class on that. I read one very good book on free will and another book written by Sam Harris. I don't know if you need to hear this, but don't read Sam Harris. I also read Marxism and Literature by Raymond Williams, which was very interesting, and I remember thinking that this was clarifying a lot of things for me, but I don't remember anything about it. But I remember that I very much enjoyed it. Anti-Semite and Jew by Jean-Paul Sartre. I love reading that era of French intellectual literary history. You can just smell the cafe while you're reading it. It's very casual but still very engaging and very theoretical. And in that same sort of atmosphere, I think my favorite philosophy book was Black Skin, White Masks by Frantz Fanon. His voice very much echoes the very casual intelligentsia vibe of Sartre and de Beauvoir, but of course to make an argument about racism at the time. It's probably the closest I'll ever come to actually respecting psychoanalysis. I don't say that lightly. I don't like psychoanalysis. But the importance of his project is that it is rooted in a vision of human liberation Liberation that is both provocative and insightful. Moving on to memoir, the very good, the narrative of Frederick Douglass. I think my favorite memoir of the year was probably Emily Bernard's Black is the Body. It's very good. Bernard is a UVM teacher, actually. I normally don't really like essay form, but I think it's a little different from memoir. You get sort of these concentric circles gathering around to create a whole vision of her life, takes on different perspectives within the totality of their own lived experience. And of course, it answers a lot of very burning questions that I have as someone who doesn't live as the minority in a very white state, and it goes there. It really goes there. It is enthralling to read. Next up in terms of politics. Of course, I got to do a section on politics. Because I couldn't choose, I picked three favorites. I read Frederick Engels' Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, which was really important for developing my own understanding of dialectical materialism. I hosted a Marxist reading group that was very successful and very fun to do. And in that book series, we also read some Rosa Luxemburg, a very dialectical thinker. I read The Essential Rosa Luxemburg, which is edited by a very dear teacher of mine, Helen Scott. And it has Rosa Luxemburg's classic Reformer Revolution, as well as the very important The Mass Strike, which I actually liked more than Reformer Revolution. We were actually not going to read The Mass Strike for the reading group, but we ended up reading it because so many people were going on strike because it was a pandemic. I don't know if you noticed this, but the ruling classes accidentally told us who the essential workers were. Whoops. And then once the Black Lives Matter movement started up again, I decided to pick up a book that's been on my shelf for way too long, which was The Black Panthers Speak 
edited by Philip S. Foner. It's a compilation of news clippings and pamphlets, speeches that key figures made. It's omitting certain voices in the Panther Party that I thought would have been pretty critical, but that being said, I mean, it was so wonderful to just dive into that. Talking about the Black Panthers back in 2016, 2017 was actually one of the things that radicalized me. I got to learn a little bit more about their particular brand of Marxist-Leninism, and it is really all their flaws and strengths. And it's important to also notice that a lot of the Black Panthers were fucking kids, and they were figuring it out as they went along. And importantly, they kept raising their internationalism, no matter what, always talking about what was going on, beyond the United States, getting ideas from out there. And it is absolutely inspiring to read. I read a little bit of poetry. I very much enjoyed Ocean Vuong's Night Sky with Exit Wounds. Very intense, very visceral, very sensual poetic voice. I'm just gonna shout out Furlington's local Rajni Eddins. Their names are mine. It was wonderful to read this while camped out at Battery Park, getting to hear him do his most famous poem almost every day. I also got a bit into mindfulness. Um, I had a really hard summer. Quarantine really kicked my ass as an extrovert. It kicked everyone's ass. And so exercise helped, but getting into mindfulness helped me feel a little bit closer to my mom who died a couple years ago. I could see how much it helped her. So I decided to try taking up a little bit of mindfulness and in the way that I do, I have to read a few books about it. I went through mom's old stash and I found Thich Nhat Hanh's Peace is Every Step, which was nice in terms of taking the pressure off of having to feel like I have to set aside time every day to meditate, seeing how you can incorporate mindfulness practice in your everyday life. And I think my favorite read in mindfulness was Leaves Falling Gently by Bauer and Wu. It's mostly focusing on mindfulness for the terminally ill, so I'd imagine that this was really important for my mom, but turns out it was really important for me too because uh, I have breathing problems, I found out. I have anxiety tethered to my breathing, so I can't focus on my breathing when I meditate. So of course they had to accommodate that because they're talking about people with disability. So that was really important to read. So anyway, that's it for what I read. I am currently reading Irish Liberation, edited by Ulick O'Connor. Shoki Arla! And I'm doing an independent study right now. I kind of fucked my vacation over because I decided to read All of Being and Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre. I'm 300 pages into Being and nothingness. Wish me luck. It, I'm, I'm spending like six to ten minutes per page on this and there's 800 pages. Oh my god, why'd I do this? So for next year, I might do 52 books. Might try to do that reading goal, a book a week. But I think my main goals are gonna be to read the Lord of the Rings books. I'm taking a class on Tolkien's Middle Earth. And I'm also gonna make sure that I read Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace all 1,000 plus pages of it, and Karl Marx's Capital, all 1,000 plus pages of it. So I'm very excited. Those are the main things, no promises beyond that. There's a question that's been kind of bothering me this year, which is why do I read? Why do I read so much? Why do I read what I do? Why do I even bother reading? During the isolation of the pandemic, the threat of nihilism was always near and it was debilitating. One of my favorite aspects about reading is the fact that I can share and have conversations about reading with other people. I just didn't have that this year for large amounts of it. I first started reading a lot after my mom died and it was just a really good way to cope and deal with grief and escape and process in a different way. But this year with my dad dying, I just have overall less energy. I'm just tired all the time these days. However, Importantly, reading goals do give me a project for organizing my life. Doing these videos is actually something that I really look forward to all year. It's one of the few things that I look forward to. I'm not really that good at planning ahead. And of course, reading is a source of edification that bleeds into all other areas of my life, even when it's prying me away from the harder parts of it. And it's just always there when I need it. So if you're not reading because you're too tired or you don't feel like it, that's very fine. It's just a thing that I do, one that brings me a lot of joy. Anyway, uh, I'm graduating soon. I've got one more semester. I'll be done in May or June. I don't really know where the next step will take me. I'm thinking I might move out of Vermont. I don't know where I will be this time next year, but I look forward to educating and growing with you all until then. I've also spent the last few months working on fixing up my parents' old house uh, with my little brother Titian, who I love very much. It's prettier than it ever has been. It's the most fulfilling project that I've had all year, especially since dad died. My dad had some huge shelves in his office that I look forward to filling with my own books um, in the coming years. I do hope to share all of that with you 
someday when we're all allowed to be in the same room together. So anyway, happy new year. 2021 is upon us. A vaccine is in the works. Let's not fool ourselves into forgetting the lessons of 2020. Now is not the time to be getting passive. Don't give up, stay vigilant, educate, and of course, enjoy the moments in between. <sighs> Didn't quite end on the big Marxist energy I was hoping to end on, whatever.